it's a, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I've never been to this part of the world and it's lovely to be here, lovely to see you all. Um, this morning I'd like to share some of my journey with open educational resources and why I believe they are and indeed should be um, a catalyst of building communities of open practice. Um, it's always a challenge to use someone else's yeah. laptop. Can, to, you can just use space bar or okay. the left. Bar. This one. There we go. Thank you. I haven't even seen a mouse in years. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, uh, well, um, as you've heard, I, I, I've worked with OER Africa since 2008. Um, and we were seeded by the Hewlett Foundation to work with faculty in African universities and share with them all of the different possibilities of OER. We weren't actually 100% sure what all of those possibilities could be, um, but we did hope and we did believe that an open license, one that made it possible to adapt teaching and learning resources of any kind and render them fit for purpose in a particular context could only be a great way to out update outdated teaching materials and improve course curriculum. With respect to building communities of practitioners of OER, we quickly concluded that OER, much like ICT, could be an extremely useful educational tool if used well. OER could facilitate useful conversations about what is possible with respect to supplementing resource-based learning and possibly open up conversations about taboo areas like pedagogy. We also believe that sharing African intellectual capital with the rest of the world under an open license would be a wonderful way to raise the profile of African scholarship and incidentally put paid to the notion of Africa as a mere consumer, but never a provider of global knowledge. And finally, we knew that in Africa, as elsewhere, OER has often been funded by donors, and so projects wax and wane in accordance with external funding cycles. We've come to believe that if OER is to be embedded within faculties, sorry, if it is to succeed in yielding its promises, um, then it has to be embedded within faculties and universities as just part of the way they conduct their day-to-day -day business of research, outreach, teaching, and learning. And as our journey continues, and we continue to learn more each day about how OER can become a mainstay of open educational practice, I hope you'll bear with me and allow me to share just some of the things that we've learned and continue to learn along our journey. Um, as implied by our name, we were established to work with faculty in English-speaking Africa and sensitize them to the possibilities of OER. Um, like faculty all over the world, faculty in Africa are hired on the basis of their subject matter expertise. In few universities anywhere is faculty proficiency in teaching as highly prized and sought after as their ability to generate world-class research and thereby increase the stature of their institutions, their own personal reputations, and higher education's purpose of building a global knowledge pool. And though most faculty everywhere are expected to display their expertise within an environment where research tends to be foregrounded above teaching and learning, Faculty in many developing countries, and particularly those who are working in publicly funded universities, face unrelenting pressure to also increase both enrollments and throughput. This is pressure exerted by governments um, who seek to see some sort of return on their investment, and increasingly by discerning societies in Africa's fast-growing economies who are demanding not just more, but better trained graduates to facilitate, encourage, and manage the incredibly rapid growth and diversification of economies and societies across a continent that is quickly and increasingly part of the global economy. But despite the increase, increasingly bullish economies scattered across the continent, Africa's faculty are typically working in universities that are generally under-resourced in terms of personnel and infrastructure. And although they're recovering steadily the ground lost to the structural adjustment programs imposed by the Bretton Woods Agency some 20 years ago, they do remain hampered to perform with excellence their key areas of research, outreach, and teaching. So in this regard, their circumstances aren't terribly dissimilar to those uh, of their American and European colleagues, similarly hindered by the global economic crisis. So when we started our work in 2008, we were very clear that in this environment, OER can't just be something nice to do. 
um, it has to be of utility, it has to perform a function, it has to contribute to filling some sort of tangible gap. And so we started by sensitizing faculty about the plethora of resources available on the net in print, audio and video under an open license. And although the faculty were very clear that some of those materials would be excellent and applicable and others not, what we both came to understand quite quickly was that the fact of an open license was critical to our context because the copyright license on textbooks, most textbooks available on our continent, renders them unaffordable to the majority of their intended users. Um, Megan was talking about the meeting, the Hewlett Grantees meeting last week in San Francisco, and one of the school teachers there mentioned that for them, um, the circumstances aren't too different. They can't afford textbooks either, and neither can their students. And so in the absence of a reliable text, what happens is that faculty on our continent tend to rely on very didactic knowledge, um, methods, um, such as their yellow notes and lectures, to ensure or try to ensure that knowledge is passed from them to their students. And we worked with these subject matter experts to, sub to support them, to adapt resources, to fill curriculum gaps where these existed, or to create resources that would allow their students to move away from didactic practices like the lecture. And where bandwidth allowed, exploration of subject-specific open repositories proved a boon. Faculty at the University of Malawi were very quick to see the advantages. At the Faculty of Agriculture, there was no set text for a communication skills course that was taught to all first year students. So we worked with faculty there to create an OER based textbook for their students, available via print on demand or readable online. Similarly, the Kamuza College of Nursing had recently changed their curriculum to case based work, but was struggling to find appropriate cases or to develop ones to incorporate into their course. So we worked with them, with the, with the faculty there, to adapt cases from respected health repositories and later to create cases where none that was suitable could be found. Of course, this depended uh, on the availability of a reliable power source and adequate bandwidth, neither of which were in ready supply. Yet, in all instances, faculty were able to work together to generate the resources required by their students and tailor them to the specific needs and learning outcomes they wish to achieve. In all instances, all of the resources were made available to the general public as well as to their students under an open license. What these processes demanded though was the updating or the acquisition of new skills around curriculum design, materials development, um, and content delivery. We discovered that this reliance by faculty on the lecture to deliver curriculum had arisen no, not so much because they were ignorant of the failings of the lecture as a means of conveying knowledge, given the universal tendency of students to fall asleep or otherwise absent themselves. It's rather that the skills to guide the students through an exploration of the myriad forms of information available to them over the internet, via traditional and social media, and in their set texts, and somehow ensure and ascertain that learning is actually taking place are not necessarily the skills of every subject matter expert. But yet, these are precisely the skills that are increasingly expected of faculty everywhere, given the reality of an increasingly networked and connected world. What we were able to demonstrate was that open and collaborative adapting and development of teaching and learning resources to render them fit for purpose in a particular context was indeed an effective way to improve curriculum and its outmoded of delivery. Because we knew that collaboration had to underpin any serious OER activity, we sought to understand from faculty the barriers and the enablers to the coll coll collaborative production and sharing of knowledge. We suspected, well we hoped, um, that OER could act as some kind of a Trojan horse, one that could open doors uh, to conversations about pedagogical practice, about embracing available technology as a mainstay of education, about harnessing collective energy towards generating elect intellectual property, and about whether that intellectual property should be shared under a license that was closed or open, and who should have the final say about that. And as we talked and, and worked with faculty in Africa and beyond the continent, we often found that the unspoken faculty question that faculty wanted answered was, what's in it for me? A deputy vice chancellor at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in Ghana answered that question when he said, 
if we share our things, um, then other people will share theirs with us. They may even criticize us, but then we learn from their criticism. He was a visionary who sparked off the Pan-African Health OER Network, as he and his faculty members not only shared unique content, such as the manifestation and treatment of particular tropical health ailments, but also led the way to their institution's adoption of an OER policy that made it possible for faculty to receive institutional recognition for internally peer-reviewed teaching and learning resources at the same level as that usually awarded for publication in peer-reviewed journals. So we learn that policy at an institutional, national or international level can either be a great enabler or a hindrance to working with OER. We found that many universities had crafted their intellectual property policies to protect their intellectual content. These were policies that tended to reward individual creation of knowledge, but frequently penalized collaborative development of the same. Conversations about OER often led to a shared recognition that once information has been digitized, the notion of protecting it or controlling it, whether under a copyright license, which may or may not be respected, or behind institutional firewalls, which we all tend to ignore um, as we share flash drives and drop boxes, is somewhat moot. Branding institutional knowledge, however, under an open license, investing it with relevant metadata, and sharing it as widely as possible through institutional repositories, global subject specific repositories, or open databases, makes it very hard for others to claim ownership of what is now squarely in the public domain with your name on it. The element of choice is an important pillar of intellectual freedom and practice, and revised IP policies should strive to encourage discernment by faculty about what they would choose to share under an open license, rather than obliging them to share everything that they produce while at their university to no particular end. At the Kwame Nkrumah University, um, the new OER policy made it possible for health faculty who were not necessarily conversant with the finer points of pedagogy, andragogy, and heutagogy to work alongside graphic and instructional designers and begin to deploy their knowledge via rich multimedia resources that were interactive and easily shared and downloaded even within the low bandwidth environments in which they worked and their students learned. While the term 21st century skills may not have been familiar one, these health faculty were only too aware that in this modern era, their students would not only need a solid grasp of their subject matter to be successful health workers, but just as critically, would have to be able to solve unforeseen problems, work constructively with others, and be adept at negotiating the various information pathways available to them. Suddenly, we were, no long, we were having conversations about the value of resource-based learning, about appropriate learning pathways, adequate student support, and relevant creative assessment. Just as suddenly, we were not having conversations about lack of power, lack of con connectivity, lack of resources, but rather being engaged in conversations about what was possible. Fuel for generators, solar powered devices, what about dedicated bandwidth? And what should our governments do about the fact that the arrival of the undersea cable has not translated into cheaper bandwidth? The Faculty of Health and the Faculty of Communication and Design were now collaborating across faculty lines as a matter of course. OER had engendered a collaborative com community of educators sharing their skills and knowledge in new ways and able to interact globally with a global community while addressing the changing needs of their own students. So what has all this meant? As mentioned earlier, one of the things we had imagined when we started on this journey was that an open license could provide a cost-effective way for faculty in Africa to contribute directly to the global knowledge pool. We've seen some evidence of this being the case. The Pan-African Health Network I just mentioned has proved a rich source of interaction for a global pool of health practitioners. A vibrant search facility enables members to write into the site and request resources to meet needs that they are encountering or gain other information around problems they need to solve. There have also been unexpected, unintended occurrences, such as when Professor Ohene Aparisem of uh, the, in Ghana 
posted onto his institutional website hematological side, slides he had developed for his students. Over dinner, um, some time back, Professor Oheno Parisem explained to us that a blood disorder may present in ways that might lead to different diagnoses depending on the physical location of the patient. In tropical conditions, a particular blood pattern might indicate a parasitic infection, while the same pattern found in a patient in continental Europe might suggest an autoimmune disorder. So Professor Oparisem then explained to us um, that he developed these slides, posted them on his website, on the University of Michigan website, and on our own OER Africa website. Um, he used standardized metadata, and this made those same resources available in global repositories. What then happened is that he got an email from a doctor in Croatia who was suffering from some kind of ailment, um, allegedly an autoimmune deficiency, um, but the treatment wasn't working. When this doctor went online and found those slides, he quickly contacted Professor Ohene Oparisem, got his doctor to work with Professor Ohene Oparisem, and together now this is a three-man team working across uh, borders to try and improve um, this particular doctor's health. Dr. Richard Phillips is a Ghanaian national um, who works alongside Professor Ohene Oparisem, and he's a specialist um, and world-renowned expert on a condition known as the Buruli ulcer. The World Health Organization notes that limited knowledge of the disease, its focal distribution, and the fact that it affects mainly poor rural communities contribute to low reporting of the cases. Modules that um, Dr. Phillips uh, created, along with his colleague, Professor Kerry Engelberg of the University of Michigan, are now being used to teach students at the University of Michigan who would otherwise have been reliant on a textbook to try and understand how this condition manifests itself. What is also happening now is that the World Health Organization has picked up on these resources and is using them to train health workers across the world. So these are just two um, instances of south-north flow of information that has arisen um, because of the use of an open license. But it's not only OER Africa and its partners that are taking advantage of the possibilities for open practices. Social media has taken on a life of its own, influencing both educational practice and the democratization of knowledge. A great example that comes to mind is Ushahidi. Last week in San Francisco, there was a young man from California who works for a Kenyan company called Ushahidi, um, and they had developed a crowdsourcing tool. And this came out as a result of the post-election violence that Kenya inflicted upon ourselves in 2008. Um, the, the rationale of the platform was that people could actually phone in and say this is where certain events are happening and so this is the kind of support that we need. The tool, uh, the same tool, one of the great advantages of it is that it was later picked up and adapted and used to great effect in Haiti during the 2010 earthquake um, and it allowed people to direct health workers and crisis support to the places where their particular services were required thereby alleviating unnecessary waste of lives, time, and resources, and making use of whatever technology was still working, SMS, Twitter, Facebook, and so forth. And while the rollout of the undersea cable has ensured that the rest of the world can now benefit directly from Africa's contribution to the global knowledge pool, the makers of, of Uf Shahidi have since turned their attention to hardware. They've developed the brick, a kind of backup generator for the internet, that is designed to keep online users who may not be connected to the grid or merely suffering an irritating power interruption. So does OER equal open practice? As most of you know, just 10 short years after the term OER was first coined at the UNESCO 2002 Forum on Open Courseware, UNESCO member states ratified the OER Paris Declaration. It seeks not only to foster awareness of the use of OER, but also to facilitate an enabling environment for the effective use of increasingly available information and communication technologies. But do well-intentioned policy positions on OER and ICT necessarily lead to more open educational practices? Many of you will be only too aware that the majority of OER work globally is donor-funded in one way or another. There are not many instances that come to mind of OER being totally embedded within the practice of a university, an expected component of all course design 
development and redevelopment, an integral component of student support, or a requirement to publish in open access journals. Rather, even those universities that have an OER policy or policy framework supportive of using OER and sharing it across a host of ICTs tend to pick and choose the components of open practice that are easiest for them to apply or the most advantageous. Nowhere is this more evident than in the current frenzy to produce a massive open online course or MOOC. A range of commentators far more experienced than I have had much to say about whether or not obliging participants to register in order to access a course makes it open or not. Others have lambasted the closed licenses appended to the content offered via the best known MOOCs or bemoaned the underrepresentation of the arts and humanities via these platforms. The dearth of open source software used to design platforms on which MOOCs have been offered has not gone unnoticed nor has the fact that most MOOC participants are, are already holders of one or more degrees, resident typically in non-developing countries, fully literate users of educational technology, and able to indulge in the luxury of dropping in and out of such course offerings without necessarily having to complete them. All of these contradictions have led many to ponder what precisely is meant by the conflation of the terms massive, open, online and course. That said though, I doubt that without the phenomenon of OER, a byproduct of the open source software movement, that MOOCs would ever have come into being, and this is important. I believe that at the heart of this conference is a question about the meaning or purpose of higher education in the 21st century, and the corresponding desire by so many involved in educational practice to explore whether a format of higher education developed hundreds of years ago in Europe to serve particular needs at that particular time retains its relevance in an increasingly interconnected and fast changing world hundreds of years later. Educationalists, students and societies at large are questioning whether going through a formalized course of study over a set period of time within an institution recognized to oversee, examine, and accredit such a process, as mentioned earlier by the opening speakers, is any more meaningful than the acquisition of knowledge through other means, a MOOC, for example, or even one or more open badges that provide a new standard to recognize learning and skills. Sir John Daniel has argued that perhaps the greatest legacy of the MOOC will be that it will cause providers of higher education everywhere to take online learning far more seriously. His argument is in keeping with the themes of this conference, which seek to explore how the building of communities of open practice can enrich the quality of education, infusing it with the complexity and diversity of people, places, methods, and ideas that should coalesce at the heart of any enlightening experience. This conference seeks to challenge us all to take learning by any means far more seriously. At OER Africa, we have come to believe that offering well-designed teaching and learning pathways, effective support to students in practical sessions, tutorials, individual counseling sessions, and online, providing students with intelligent assessment and critical feedback on their performance should result in students who are far better equipped with both the disciplinary and holistic skills demanded of today's graduates. Used in this way, openly licensed educational materials have tremendous potential to improve quality, accessibility, and effectiveness of education, while serving to restore a core function of education, the sharing of knowledge. Consequently, it may be opportune for universities to think strategically about the extent to which their policies, practices, and institutional cultures reward individual endeavor over collaboration and create inefficiencies by prizing, in principle, creation of new materials over adaptation and use of existing materials and content. In short, OER Africa has come to believe that the transparency provided by OER places social pressure on institutions and teaching staff to improve quality, 
promotes better curricular coordination and provides resources for students' learning and for academic planning. Open educational resources are indeed a catalyst for building communities of open practice. I wish you all a wonderful conference. Thank you. We'll keep that on a minute. Um, we, we're going to uh, just have a, a few moments for questions, but I just want to thank you ever so much for such a fantastic uh, keynote speak. I think it was really quite inspiring. And all the way through that, I was just looking at that word just in front of there, which, you know, life. And I think you touched on that quite touchingly. So just, I'd rather, I want to give you a round of applause again because I really you. enjoyed it. Thank you very much. So I think we're going to just nip into coffee five minutes late. We're going to have ten minutes for questions, if that's all right for everybody. So we have a roving mic here. So if you do want to ask a question, please put your hand up. Somebody will come and pass you the mic and then just um, start speaking so we can capture it for the video camera sound. So if anybody has a question for Catherine, please do um, put your hand up. Right at the back. Thanks, Catherine. It was a fabulous talk. So thanks again. Um, Tony Coughlin from the British Open University. You talked primarily about formal learning. I can't believe you've got nothing to say about informal learning. <laughs> Would you like to say anything about informal learning? Um, I don't have very much experience of how OER are, are being used for informal learning across the continent. Um, but I do have, I suppose, um, anecdotal evidence of, of, of how um, OER are being used. Um, I know, for example, that there is a woman who is in the process of creating one of the largest businesses um, around children's furniture. And she's learned um, a lot about making that furniture by going online. Um, in other informal uses, which are related still to the academy, um, are around agriculture, uh, which I touched on um, earlier. And uh, one of the projects we, were, we are involved in is called AgShare. And the idea of AgShare there is to try and understand why it is that every single time we have uh, a, a drought um, in Africa, we have famine, because the two should not be related. People should be able to store their food in, in ways. And, and, and given that we have so many faculties of agriculture across the continent, um, we were trying to understand wh where the problem lies. And um, there was a sense that there's a huge disconnect between what is being taught in the universities and what is actually happening in the field. Um, and Agsha was trying to bring those two together to connect the farmers in the field. Um, and the way that that's done is by getting students to go out into the field, to work with farmers, to develop case studies with them, and to take those case studies back into the academy so that the curriculum um, for agriculture at, at, at the Bachelor of Science level is constantly being updated. And so this happens every single year so that students are not learning things that happened a long time ago, but constantly updating their knowledge. Then taking that knowledge back to the farmers, repackaging it so that it's suitable to their needs. And then, you know, cr trying to create that kind of a virtuous circle. Suzanne Boyle, University of Manchester. Um, thank you for an amazing paper. Um, I spent some time working with international students from Africa and India and I appreciate the value they place on lectures and that traditional approach. So I was interested in what sort of uh, management of student expectations and incul inculcating skills for the students to adopt to OER, that it becomes not just an add-on to the lectures but you're replacing it over time. So what support has been given to students in Africa for that? Hmm. Um, with the universities or with the faculty in the universities that, that we've worked with, one of the things that they're realizing is whether or not the students and they themselves are, are used to the lecture and like the lecture for, for whatever reasons, um, it just doesn't work. It's, it's as simple as that. You, you can't be lecturing um, in a room this size that is supposed to hold, what, maybe 100 people and it's now holding a thousand people. They can't see, they can't hear, they can't, it, it doesn't work. Um, 
And as to what kind of support, they're giving the best support they can, um, give, give, given the circumstances that they have. Um, there are pockets of work that are going on, for example, at the, the Faculty of Health at the University of Cape Town, where there are some lecturers who are actually working with their students to develop resources so that the students are involved in their own learning in that way. Um, but it is a good question. And it's one of the things that OER Africa wants to do next, which is basically embed ourselves in very few universities over a long period of time, three, three years, and try and understand what actually are the barriers and what are the support mechanisms that are required if OER is truly going to be embedded in the ways that we're advocating. Uh, Rob Farrow, The Open University UK. I was just wondering if you could say a little bit about the technological infrastructure in Africa. Um, I'm sort of wondering, uh, are a lot of OERs being done in paper formats and just kind of copied uh, in areas where there isn't good internet access or stuff like that? I don't know enough about it really, so do you have anything to say about that? Sure, I, I can try and say a little bit about that. Um, so when, when we started working, we realized that any, any, faculty, any support we give to faculty to develop OERs will have to result in OERs that can be shared via print because it's the most common form um, of, of, of media. But one of the interesting things um, that we found is that a project that some of my colleagues are involved in is called the African Storybook. And this is around early childhood literacy. Um, and those who know that field are aware that the way that we learn to read um, is by reading many, many stories, many, <laughs> that are age appropriate. Um, because we don't have enough texts generally across the continent, children's texts in particular, people aren't learning how to read um, as well as they could. One of the challenges around that is that we found that in, in Turkana, in northern Kenya, it doesn't matter if you give children books. Um, the conditions there are such that the books will desiccate. So we're actually working on a way to get um, resources online in, in that area. Um, we're hoping that the bandwidth will come um, and we're working within the confines that we can. So flash disks, um, oh. solar powered laptops, whatever we can use. Um, because what we were determined not to do is to allow what doesn't exist to be a barrier. Work with what we've got. We're just going to take one more question. Okay. Uh, I'm Stephen Haggard. I'm interested in um, the case of Africa, whether some of the most powerful applications that have developed in impact in educational and development settings, I'm thinking of M-Pesa and on the other hand, Isoko, which is not open source, whether you can talk about the, um, the extent to which the open sourceness of those applications do you think is responsible for their, um, their power and their impact, or to what extent we might also think about some of the other commercial drivers um, and uh, business and organizational context that those applications have worked in that has made them so successful and capable of uh, delivering impacts that are uh, influential on education, obviously, but also on other kinds of uh, vocational um, and uh, informal education too. Um, in, in my experience, and, and I, I, I should... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's quite difficult when you go around calling yourself OER Africa because then people expect you to speak on behalf of the continent and so it's, it's a huge continent. Um, but in, in my experience of something like M-Pesa and even the kinds of uses of OER that we've seen is that people respond to something that actually meets a need. Um, the driver is not necessarily whether it's openly licensed or not, whether you're talking about um, software, uh, or, or content, that, that's not the driver. It's the thing that allows you to share these things um, thereafter. But if something is of good quality and it actually meets a need like M-Pesa did, um, then people pick it up uh, pretty quickly. That, that's, that has been my experience anyway. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, uh, thank you to Catherine and to Tim and to Wendy. Thank you very much for me. Thank you.